Conservative leader Pierre Polyev was asked again today about his position on Alberta's gender identity policy. He again used the opportunity to attack the Prime Minister, but he also revealed where he stands on puberty blockers for minors. Justin Trudeau is again puffing out his chest, trying to divide Canadians and attack parents who are trying to protect their kids. He's interested in using this as a divisive wedge. Just to be clear, you said yes, only adults should take puberty blockers? I think we should protect children. Let them make adult decisions when they become adults. Now, all of this follows Alberta Premier Daniel Smith's proposal to ban the use of hormone therapies for kids 15 and under in that province. It's time to talk about this with the Power Panel. Amanda Alvaro is a former Liberal Party communication strategist and here with me in Ottawa. Tim Powers, a former strategist for Conservative parties. Sherelle Evelyn is managing editor of The Hill Times. And Matthew Dubé is a former NDP MP. All right, gang. Uh, Tim, I, I want to start with you. Less about the position mm -hmm. Pierre Polyev took and more about how many attempts it took to get to this point. You know, the rigid <laughs> message discipline of only talking about the, 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 you know, crime and the economy, this dragged out over a series of days before we got to this answer. What do you make of what happened there? Yeah, I think he recognizes he can't not say something here. Um, it's not just Daniel Smith who's brought forward a position like this, though hers is the most advanced and, in my view, egregious. Uh, Premier Higgs, Premier Mo, others, certainly there are people in different conservative parties, and not just the conservative party, but it's been conservative premiers, who who aren't opposed to what Premier Smith and the other premiers are talking about. Right. Though, look, I gotta say, whether it's Pierre Polyev, Randy Boisano, or Daniel Smith, I think this thing is too politicized, uh, and it's not helping anybody, but particularly the kids who and families who may be dealing with this. The only people, David, I think who should be talking about puberty blockers and other medical approaches are people who actually have medical knowledge who work in this field. It's a bit sickening to watch this play out, but it's playing out because the liberals on one side see an opportunity to go after Mr. Polyev. And I suppose Mr. Polyev believes there is part of the constituency that he supports that does want him to give voice to things like parental rights. Mm -hmm. Though again, I think that is a whole argument that's been taken the wrong way here. Parents, of course, have some role to play here, but it shouldn't be politicians determining this. It should be kids, parents, and physicians. Right. So, so Amanda, in laying out this position today, uh, Mr. Polyev also accused the Prime Minister of using this as a wedge issue, even though this was Danielle Smith's uh, announcement, not the Prime Minister's. Mm -hmm. And while the Liberals were quick to jump on it, you also hear from people in these particular communities that they want people to be their advocates. So what do you make of, of where this landed today with him basically backing Daniel's policy after sort of trying to say it was a parental rights issue in the past. Well, not just backing it, but actually taking it a step further, right? Like, it's an interesting, it's such a hot potato issue. There's been so much heat on it all week as we watched Danielle Smith kind of navigate these waters and how the Liberals jumped in on it. So it was somewhat surprising, and I agree, somewhat sickening, to use Tim's word, to see Polyev take it even a step further. So Danielle Smith talked about puberty blockers, uh, removing access for children under 15. Pierre Polyev took it a step further today, talked about nobody under 18, so a ban on that, which is in direct opposition, obviously, to the Canadian Pediatric Society, who makes the case that access is important, it's part of comprehensive care, and that it also lowers suicidal thoughts and risks. And so I guess my question back, you know, my thoughts on it as I watched it unfold today was he talked about protecting children. He kept using that language because that's really saleable language. But mm. which children? The children with suicidal thoughts? Because the Canadian Pediatric Society says that that's the exact opposite thing that you should be doing. This is going to be an issue that we will see play out because it's such a hot potato. And wherever there's heat, you'll see the parties come together to create this wedge. But it's about ideology. It's not about protecting anybody. So, so Matthew, uh, on this, um, you know, he, he's used jurisdiction uh, in the past to say, you know, it, it's, it's provincial jurisdiction of the Canada Health Act and obviously minority rights under the charter would be the job of a prime minister uh, uh, to deal with. The level of attention this has gotten <clears throat> when the data we've seen from Tyler Dawson at the National Post is that eight people under the age mm -hmm. of 18 in Alberta last year had the top surgery, nobody had the bottom surgery, eight people. Is this the sort of policy that requires this level of political focus and sweeping government intervention when it's so small it wouldn't overwhelm the health system or the school system? 
That's a great question. It's a good question for the premier, clearly, because I think that was sort of the irony in what Pierre Polyev was saying as he was accusing the prime minister of creating this wedge issue. But ultimately, you know, it sounds so childish to say who started it, right? But it, that's where, where it started, is, is, is through uh, Premier Smith and the decisions that she made from a policy perspective. Um, I really think the, the challenge that he has, Pierre Polyev, is that he deferred to the province on everything but this for some reason. Like, why would you defer, oh, it's the province that has to take care of it on everything but this? And the other point, just to echo a little bit uh, what Amanda was getting at there about the, the issue about protecting children, is that ultimately they will be likely the most harmed through these policies, uh, those who are going through a uh, very difficult time and some of the mental health consequences that can come from that, not being able to access these resources potentially. But more importantly, I think it's unfortunately revealing from, from what Mr. Polyev is saying about protecting children, because this seems to me to speak to the segment of the population that believes in some arguably conspiracy-esque mm -hmm. uh, theory about what schools are doing to children, for example, and things like that. So I do think it's a bit concerning in that respect. Uh, and again, if you want to keep pivoting back to affordability and, and issues like that, that presumably are the ones that matter, uh, I don't know why you wouldn't do it across the board and decide to answer substantively on, on one issue. That's, I think, where yeah. something is off about that. Yeah, John Ibbotson in the Globe Mail had a very strong column about this uh, the other day. He wrote about it with a real uh, uh, moral clarity and, and empathy uh, for the kids in this situation. But Cheryl, I'm wondering, you know, Pierre Polyev doesn't do a lot of news conferences in Ottawa, doesn't do a lot of scrums in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. He did this in Montreal. He had a press conference in Montreal yesterday he was asked about this, accused reporters of disinformation. Justin Ling has written about this today on a Substack. He got pushed on this today, not aggressively, not impolitely, but pushed to give an answer, and he finally did. What, what do we take from the, the way this all rolled out in the last couple of days with him? Well, I, you'd have to imagine that I would, or at least I would wonder if he's not, not thinking, okay, well, the fact that I'm not answering this question is becoming more of a story than the, any mm -hmm. answer that I would actually give. Mm -hmm would be my assumption why he couldn't have just said that from the beginning. It's not like it's a real secret as to uh, where Pierre Polyev stands on this. He's had, you know, he's had rallies outside of, again, outside of Ottawa, and he's had, he's given speeches, and he's talked about, you know, the prime minister enforcing his own quote-unquote radical gender ideology, which is a huge dog whistle to a certain segment of the population that thinks that, um, you know, people are being forced to transition or that people aren't, you know, born with, you know, as transgender or have uh, gender dysphoria or any of the other things that some of these um, interventions are meant to help with. Um, so it's not like he hasn't kind of positioned himself on this. So the fact that he wasn't just giving a response to, hey, there's a fellow conservative premier uh, who has put out this policy and you haven't said where you stand on it. If you want to be prime minister for this country, um, you are going to be expected to weigh in whether or not you do as, you know, maybe Tim said, or, you know, has been said that, you know, this is a jurisdictional issue and you want to, you know, fluff around in it that way, but to try to turn it around on the prime minister, which is his usual go-to, yeah. It just doesn't really work on this one because it's not like Prime Minister Trudeau was the one who initiated this policy. The, the, all, all that is true, but there's a lot of blame that can go around here in not managing this conversation and this topic responsibly. Look, I have a lot of time for Randy Boissano, uh as a as a person and as a minister. I appreciate what he's trying to do in this debate by making the comparison to the conservatives' positions alleged to real to magma. But that's not helpful either. I mean, there, as Amanda just cited, uh, as you just cited, use the facts here. Use the real arguments. When you torque it up on both sides, you're getting away from the w what substantive policy considerations should be, if any. The second thing I'd say where maybe there's some political um, mischief happening here and or an attempt to tap into a broader conversation. I'm sure we've all heard the conversations from different people uh, trying to figure out how systems of pronouns work and how identity works. And you will hear people who have not had the opportunity to learn and understand some of the things we do about identity develop a frustration around that. And I think that, that that's, a, that's a conversation perhaps he's trying to wade in, he being Polyev here, but it's a dangerous one to wade in, as is the whole notion of parental rights. Because again, it's, the, the, there's a portrayal that somehow parents aren't 
part of a discussion with a child about their identity. Again, every circumstance is different. Right. And, but I think it's a bit reckless to go down that path to uh, knowing some of the things Amanda just shared on, on the mental health front. But all parties are guilty of this. They're stoking it up okay. to a point where it's hard to have a responsible conversation about important subjects to many Canadians. Right, but, but Amanda, like, there's a generational thing at play here too. Young Canadians mm -hmm. are not as uncomfortable with these conversations and with right. the gender fluidity as, as people my age, you know, born, who saw Star Wars in the theater. But, <laughs> you know, the original. Tim, Tim talking, yeah, exactly. Uh, but, but Tim talking about the, the, MAGA, the MAGA stuff, and I know the Liberals are using that, yeah. but a lot of these policies are mimicking things we're seeing from places like Florida, the Ron DeSantis policies on these things. And it is, you know, the New York Times did a really good piece on how trans became a fundraising and mobilizing issue for the social right uh, in the United States. And, and the argument is that it's migrated here. That's right. And, and it has. I mean, and we would be remiss not to not to identify what is reality. I mean, you're seeing so many of those policies transcend from the border um, into ours. And you're seeing how and listen, this is a party, the Conservative Party in particular is a party who's very strategic around their communications. For sure, they're doing research on this issue. For sure, they know, you know where Canadians lie on this issue. They know how some of these issues have been torqued in the U.S., been used to create headlines, generate, as you've been mentioning, um, fundraising opportunities. All of these things play into what could be maybe their election issues, issues that are talked about to galvanize the base, issues that, or, or maybe just appease the base. But for whatever reason uh, it may be, it does emulate what's happening south of the border. So to me, that it doesn't seem unreasonable at all that the Liberals would call that out. So, so Matthew, on this, like the, the, there has been a lot of praise uh, on this program from pundits on, on the message discipline and the communication strategy of the Conservatives, and they stuck to like the three to four key things. How instructive is this that a, another issue, you know, that you don't plan for, that you don't account for, forces you to, to weigh in on something that maybe you've been trying to avoid? It's, I think what it points to is we talk a lot about the call coming from inside the House with regards to caucus members, but I do think at some point there may be a reckoning with Premier Smith as well in terms of how Pierre Polyev positions himself vis-a-vis -vis her because this isn't the first issue. There was also the talk around CPP, you know, with pensions where he waffled a bit on that. And I mean, this is a bit of the death by a thousand cuts piece, right? And I think when you look at, you know, Premier Ford, for example, who's also a conservative premier who managed to Seem seemingly more deftly navigate around the issue, and he has jurisdiction uh, in a lot of these things as well. So I do think, you know, to Sherelle's point, I think this this need to ramp up the messaging and, you know, lay blame at the prime minister. And, you know, the irony about talking about divisive politics is nothing's more divisive than talking about divisiveness, <laughs> right? Like, that's sort of the thing. So rather than just say, you know, these are complicated issues, the premier is dealing with it within her jurisdiction, and just repeating that ad nauseum until folks in your profession just, uh, you know, <laughs> give up and, and leave him alone for the day. You know, they chose to take a different tact, and I think, I think at some point they're just going to have to decide how they address uh, things that are happening in Alberta that, you know, uh, may not be uh, the best approach uh, across the country for them politically. Cheryl, just as a final point, uh, you know, the Hill Times always has a, its finger on the pulse of what's happening in caucuses and in backbenches. Uh, in the past, we've seen some loud voices in the Conservative caucus talking about LGBTQ plus issues. We're not seeing it this time, and I know that they were advised in the memo that Marika Walsh at The Globe got her hands on. What, what do we make uh, of that silence from the caucus? Well, again, it comes back to that idea of message discipline, right? And everybody's been really locked down on certain things. And there have been issues where people have said, well, hey, where are people like Melissa Lanceman on this, who has been vocal in the past mm -hmm. about other, you know, conservative leaders even? Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that there is this silence, it is very telling. And it is, um, it does speak to the idea that, you know, okay, well, we can open the door a little bit for the leader to say something, but that's about as far as it goes. We don't want to have any distraction. But once this door has been opened, I find it difficult to believe that others who uh, maybe more, uh, you know, str start, uh, stridently believe and mm -hmm. back what uh, Premier Smith is, is doing are going to be a little louder now that they've felt that there's a little bit of leeway just because, well, now that mm -hmm. the leaders crack the seal and, you know, it's all fair game. Yeah.